Ok. Okay, so the, the first part of the training is that we will uh, see how the contribution process goes and I will uh, give you a, a theory of things and then examples, otherwise it's completely boring. So first let's say we, we come to a new free software project. In the case of Ceph, because that's the example I will take uh, all over this course, because that's the uh, project of interest to us. Uh, let's say you first arrive uh, to the Ceph community. Uh, you're interested in contributing, but you've never actually uh, did anything. You don't even know the project. So the first thing I tend to do is to run GORS on the Git of the project. GORS is actually something that shows you uh, the pulse of the project over the years. Uh, so I could uh, give you an example here because I happen to have GORS and the uh, checkout of here of the Ceph Git was there and uh, let's see. Oh, I will try again here and move here. So that's how it looks. That was back in 2004, and we see that Sage created the first files. Of course, this does not actually tell us how the project goes, but uh, we see that it was a one-guy operation at the beginning. With a project that spans over 10 years, you want to go faster, so there is an option for Gores to do that, which allows it to uh, go a lot faster and then what I do when I come to a new project is that I watch it in the background. So I let it, uh, I explore the sources and while I do that, uh, at the corner of my eye, I have this video playing. Uh, so I get a sense of how dynamic the project is. It's absolutely non-rational, but it, the funny thing is, it has very different shapes depending on the project. So here, I never actually run it on Ceph, uh, but uh, here, we, here we are. So th the general idea, whether you use GORS or something else, is that you want to get a sense of what the project is like before engaging into it. You want to see how many contributors there are, uh, how old the project is, when was the last update. You, you don't want to end up into a project that is dead, etc. Then, to be more specific, what matters to you as a contributor is to figure out who is behind the project. Because if you try to contribute to a project where you have mostly individuals driven by their passion and not by their contract with their employers. You will not talk to them, you will not think about what they did and what they do and how they will receive your contribution in the same way as if uh, you were talking to uh, company employees. Their incentive is very different. So, uh, for instance, you come from the VLC project, which is, there are a lot of companies um, actually uh, working with VLC. But initially, the project is driven by students from Ecole Centrale. So that gives a flavor to the project. And you know that when you talk to the project, you will mostly talk to students, former students, who did this project because they like it, not because they were paid for it. Going back to Ceph, 
uh, it's pretty much similar. That is, initially, my perception uh, of the project is it's a one-guy operation. Coming from a company, he had a great idea. He went back to school and he wrote a paper on it. So it's uh, not corporate, rather personal. And then he turned out, uh, he was persistent enough to work on the project for many years, and only recently did it become a company operation. So Ink Tank was founded in 2012, and then uh, Sage, who initiated the project, is employed by Ink Tank, and now most of the developers are employed by Ink Tank. So only recently did it become a really a corporate business. And if you look at the contributors around Ceph, there are companies who try to use it mostly, and very few actual developers contributing to the core who are individuals doing that on their spare time. Uh, in my case, my company pays me to work on Ceph, and uh, your company also pays you to uh, work on Ceph on the Redos Gateway. So there we have the incentive of the people in place and their history. The project social group then is something that is uh, most difficult to figure out. But sometimes you can. For instance, I have no clue if uh, the current CEF uh, project members have been friends, if they hung out on the weekend, and so on. But if I knew that, maybe I would better understand what's going on. Uh, if they are just company employees, mostly working because their, um, their employer tells them, my client wants that, something will happen that is different than what happens in Ceph, for instance, during the weekend, I can see that uh, the ink tank employees uh, connect, they work on the, on the bugs, they review patches. I also see that in the weekend they do not work all the time, so that's the mark of a uh, company employee. But they seem to be very driven because there is activity in the weekend. Where on other projects, there are absolutely no activity during the weekend. It's, they are nowhere to be found. So it seems to be a mixture of that. And uh, when a project is large enough, uh, which is the case of Ceph, it's not as large as the Linux kernel, where you have many social groups. But it seems that in Ceph, you have a few very different uh, groups. You have been working on the Rados Gateway. And it's a group of people uh, where the lead, Yehuda, has a personality where he codes a lot, he commits a lot, but he is not very verbose. So it, all the, the people around the Rados Gateway, they are not as chatty as the people uh, around the core of Ceph. That's my perception of it. And when I go to the, um, to the RRC channel, I don't see the same thing when it comes to uh, Rados Gateway, because they, uh, they are different group of people. So th there are maybe two groups also. When you figure out who is around you, uh, the idea is that you decide how you will behave. Unlike the real life, uh, the goal is to have some software working. So you, you have to consciously choose to be someone. You're not in real life. It's not, uh, you, you don't want to make friends. If it comes along the way, that's a good thing. But primarily, you want to be able to contribute to the project. And for instance, if, like me, you tend to speak a lot, uh, it may be better, let's say I'm trying to contribute to Rados Gateway, where I say that the group of people uh, is not so chatty. Then I will maybe shut up a little and code more. Not talk about what I think should be done, but rather do something and then talk about how it could have been done 
uh, in another way. That is, code speaks more in the Rados Gateway subworld of Ceph than in the um, uh, core. The, um, at least that's uh, my perception. I suppose uh, it, it would really, when, I, uh, when people listen to what I just say, uh, and they know more than I do, it may seem very bizarre to them and say, oh, that's the image we project, or is it completely crazy? But so, uh, in, uh, I'm working on the eraser coding part of uh, Ceph, which is in the core. And I have many doubts, and I tend to write and uh, ask Sam about things that should be done, and I'm worried about a lot of things. So I move code along, but I do not code massively and then backtrack massively. I tend to step uh, cautiously, and that works because Sam and Sage are responsive to my uh, inquiries. If they were not, I would have to code more. Also because, as you can hear, I'm not a native English speaker, I know that I cannot express myself as well as if I, were, uh, I was speaking French. And I could just ignore that. Uh, but I must be very careful about that because it means that when I write mail, I have to read it back three times before I'm absolutely sure that I did not introduce a mistake because uh, English is not my uh, first language. In order to uh, do that, I tend to stick to simple phrases and to avoid any idioms. Uh, Sky my husband, for instance. Uh, because they or don't make any humor. So I, I, I like to make jokes when uh, I speak French, but I refrain from doing that when uh, I'm, I speak English because half of the time I will get it wrong, I will not understand, I will look like a fool, etc. So actually, the point here is depending on the project and depending on your skills, you will have personality that is very different from the one you use to project in real life or even online when using your mother tongue. Your mother tongue, your native language. Yeah, that's the kind of expression that I tend to avoid. Um, then there is an asset or um, also a handicap that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, I, in the past, I made friends with people I never met. This uh, a Norwegian friend. Uh, we discussed online. You, we even worked on contract uh, online during two years. We never met, and we came to be very close. That happens a lot to a lot of people, but we must not forget that even in the computer science realm, there are a lot of people. Maybe half of them who have never uh, experienced a relationship, an actual relationship with a human being, not just for work, uh, online. When I give this course, I ask to the people in the audience, so here everybody is experienced in that, uh, who has a friend uh, who was only met online, whatever online is. And most of the time, half of the people, only half of the people, had that experience. This is important because when you try to figure out what happens on the other side, when you work on your contribution, you may only have one line on IRC or one message, one main message of three lines to figure out the state of mind of the upstream, of the guy who will, or the girl, who will accept or not your contribution, who will reject it, who will comment on it. So you have very little uh, clues about what's going on. If you have a previous experience of making friends online, it's a big advantage because you, you learn how to decode very tiny clues and make something out of them. So then, and it's deliberate. I focus on the social uh, thing. 
because as will become more uh, and more obvious as we go, uh, contributing is about talking to people. It's very rarely about doing technical uh, stuff right. There are many, many ways to do the, uh, things, technically speaking, right. Uh, but in the end, the contribution process is about having someone else accepting your work. And it's not only technical. It's how you communicate about your work. But now, they, there is also a technical part in the process, something that is completely rational and explained. So uh, when you first go to the project, you find the page that explains uh, how the project goes. Uh, every successful free software project has a how to contribute page, and Ceph also has that. There is even a file how to contribute with a lot of rules. Actually, most of the times, there are many, uh, not just one, and you have to figure out which one is the current one. But then you can go to IRC and just ask, oh, I found two how to contribute pages, which is the one uh, that I should use. That's the case in Ceph, because you have the file in the repository and you also have uh, pages online. Um, then you want to figure out what are the communication channels. Most of the projects have IRC mailing lists and more. So you have this list, but you have to figure out more than that. You have to figure out where the people talk. So back to uh, people uh, discussing about the core or Rados Gateway. See, my perception is that Rados Gateway is discussed more on the mailing list rather than IRC. And also, when we are in Europe, uh, it's more difficult to catch people on IRC because there is a nine-hour uh, gap. So uh, it's fortunate that Rados Gateway, um, for Rados Gateway contributors, uh, that Rados Gateway uh, uses the mailing list more because of the time delay. And when you send a mail, you expect an answer within 24 hours, where when you communicate on IRC, you expect an answer uh, within the hour, if the person is around. So once you have this list, uh, you, you need to find where the social group you are interested in actually communicates and what it communicates. Regarding the what should I do, how are you, uh, is my patch good, would you like to review kind of discussion, uh, there is a communication channel Maybe IRC, for instance. But there also is the communication channel for sending patches. So in, at the moment, for instance, in Ceph, uh, some people send patches on the mailing list, which is your preferred way to do it. But there seems to be a transition uh, to making pull requests using GitHub, which I dislike because it's proprietary software. But it's the way the project goes. So when uh, this is the communication channel for sending patches. Once you have identified a communication channel, what I recommend when coming to a new project is to ask a question. So a little bit of history about myself. In 2010, I decided that I would spend a year going from project to project and contribute to them just one day. So I had actually one day after engaging in a project to make a significant uh, contribution. Significant as in a patch, maybe a one-liner, but significant that is more than chatting online. And I found during this year that when you come to a new project, if you just find something to say, you will learn a lot about the people who are around, you will get to be known, and it's, it's fairly difficult when you know the project uh, just for a day to find something sensible to say. Of course you can say hi, that does not help much, but you have to think about, I'm going to contribute, so you always have something to say. There always is something to be improved in the contribution process. 
And the, the reason is simple, is because there are not many contributors at the moment. So, uh, worldwide, not just for CEF. CEF has uh, tens of people working on it. It should have hundreds of people. And worldwide, uh, in, there are, uh, co the contributor is a very scarce resource. So when you, you walk the contribution path, chances are nobody walked the path in the past month. So you will find blockers, typos in the contribution, and that gives you the opportunity to say, okay, I will fix this typo in the contribution, how to. And also you must be always very friendly. So I state that because it seems to be obvious, but it's not. You have to be over-friendly. You have to, be, to exaggerate uh, being friendly. Uh, you know that because you're used to online relationships, but some people do not realize that when you speak online, uh, your body language is not there. So you, people cannot see you smiling, they do not hear your tone. And so by being over-friendly with smileys and uh, goodwill and say ha 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 or that kind of exaggeration, uh, people will think you're dull and you're sad, where you're really not. You're smiling in front of your screen, but that does not show on ROC. Once we've done that, find the people, communicate, engage immediately with them. Uh, we have to learn the tools. And it's a pain because uh, we all tend to like uh, the tools we work on. So people on Launchpad uh, like Bazaar very much. And a lot of people like that. But when you are a free software contributor, when you come to a project, you're not going to change the tools they use, even if they are wrong. And sometimes it's painful because they are not only wrong, but they are also proprietary software. But if your goal is to have code upstream, you have to accept what the choice they made. Maybe later on, let's say two years from now, you keep being a good contributor and then you get a chance to say, mm, maybe we should change this tool because this one is better. So when you level up in the project, you get a chance to have a say in the tools that are used. But in the meantime, you have to just accept what they are. So uh, we, we took the example of uh, sending patches. At the moment, there are two paths, uh, GitHub, uh, pull request or sending a patch in a very kernel way on the mailing list and then it's handled. Uh, the tracker also uh, matters a lot. Uh, a lot of people dislike Redmine. Uh, actually I did, uh, I dislike Redmine a lot. Uh, I tend to use, uh, when I can, much more simpler tools such as uh, Track. And even track, I find it uh, way too complicated. So I tend to use no tools, which, uh, yeah, that's, but that's another topic. So I use Redmine. In the case of Ceph, uh, Redmine is used throughout the project, and uh, by including the Ink Tank employees, which is fairly rare and nice. So we use this uh, tool that is not just a tool designed for the community, but we know that it's also the tool that is used to organize the work of the Ink Tank employees. So as a contributor, we do not feel like outsiders. When possible, the tracker uh, is the place where you can see if there is a split between the corporate culture and the contribution culture. When things happen and you don't see them in the tracker, it's a sign that you're missing something. Something happens behind the scene, and you as a contributor, you don't, you don't get to see it. So you see things popping. It makes it very difficult for you as a contributor to figure out what's going on and where, how you should behave. So the tracker uh, is not only something that we must learn and accept, but also something that tells you a lot about the core uh, contributors of the project. 
In the case of the Redmine used by Ceph, there are additional plugins also used because they, uh, they are organized uh, with agile methods, which is quite obvious when you look at the roadmap where uh, they speak about sprints, etc. And uh, in so you, you see, you, you have to learn about Redmine if you don't know it already, but you also have to uh, try to understand the specific plugins they added for handling Agile so that you can read what's happening. Yeah, feel free to interrupt if you have any question. I will interrupt myself to make sure <coughs> the recording is still going on. Okay, it's still going on. We'll have to do some montage. Um, so we have the tools, we have the people, we, we, we figure out that we, we should behave uh, in, a, in a certain way. And the key, again, is to engage immediately. With that, there is an idea that is uh, uncommon, is you, of course, you get to talk to the people on RRC, so you get to send a mail to make contact. But also what proves to be fairly effective is to talk to people who are not the upstream. That is, of course, you want to be known to the upstream. But in the Ceph channel, for instance, you have 200 people. A lot of them, they are just uh, newbies coming and trying to use Ceph. And you can make contact with them instead of the upstream. That works also, because uh, you discover the, the project or you know uh, more than they do on the project, maybe you can help them. And so you get to exist in the community, where if you just don't say anything, uh, you don't exist, you, you don't get noticed. And being noticed uh, gives you an aura, a karma, that will matter after when you ask for your contribution to be evaluated. The people will, uh, will get a sense of who you are. Uh, they will just not see the contribution coming and say, okay, it's a patch. No, they, they will see that it's a patch from the guy who I heard talking on RRC from time to time, or I saw his mails in the mailing list. So there you will become the guy behind the patch versus the patch just by itself. When possible, uh, it's good to mingle, uh, but it depends on the project. Uh, I get a sense that on Ceph, for instance, I don't see a lot of mingling, but sometimes uh, on Friday evening, let's say, or maybe during the weekend, or sometime out of the blue, uh, there is uh, discussion that goes on that is completely off topic, people have fun. And when that happens and you're around, uh, and if you feel like it, then uh, you can participate. And it's also, uh, it tells everyone uh, part of who you are. And then, what's also unusual uh, is that you should try to expand uh, your network, to play with your network about your contribution. You should try to speak to people you, uh, you know, even if they are not directly interested by the project. In the case of Ceph, it's fairly easy to do that. So you go, uh, uh, you're in a, at a party or you're having a beer with a friend and he asks you what, what you're doing. So you can explain Ceph because it's sexy and uh, it's the future of storage, so it's always a good story. But you can also uh, tell him about the contribution you're going to make. If you don't get to meet uh, friends, you can uh, uh, send mails to friends saying, saying you'll contribute. You try to pick friends you uh, will be able to talk to in the future about this contribution. And the core reason why uh, I think it's important is that at some point you will get frustrated. It always happens. 
you are a contributor, so you don't have as much responsibility as the upstream. That's the good side. But the, the downside of that is that you have to ask permission for a number of things. And when you don't get this permission, you get frustrated. So by being a contributor, uh, you will be frustrated uh, over and over. When that happens, it's very important that you don't just yell at the upstream because you're frustrated. Because you are online, they, they don't owe you anything. And so you could repress that, or you could just tell a friend that is not involved with the project, well, these fuckers won't accept my contribution, and that I'm very upset that I want to kill them. But that you can say to this friend. And it's a lot better than starting a flame war on the mailing list because you're frustrated. So these people come handy uh, because they are outside of your network and because they understand and they sympathize about your difficulties. So we are human. At some point, we have difficulties. And it's good to, uh, to be able to uh, do that, but outside of the circle of contribution. And then sometimes when you speak uh, to people uh, in your network, good thing happens that is you discover that someone who knows someone who knows someone who actually is working on Seth. So you get to meet people uh, because of that. That happens sometimes. <clears throat> then there is the choice of the contribution. When your boss asks you to work on a specific topic, you don't have uh, such a lecture. Uh, but it's fairly rare. That is, your boss rarely tells you, go to the tracker, see this bug, fix this bug specifically, and then come back to me two days after that. I will tell you what to do. What happens most of the time, and what I have, and uh, uh, is we would like a regular coding to be available in self. That's a very long-term goal. And so uh, I get to do this contribution eventually. But in the meantime, I have to choose what kind of contribution I want to do first. And choosing this contribution when you first come to the project is of great importance because that's what establishes who you are with the project, technically speaking. I recommend that uh, if you have coding skills, uh, you try code. But some people uh, don't have coding skills, and if they want to contribute one time to the project, they can choose documentation too. But in the case of erasure coding, for instance, uh, when I first came to Ceph, I decided, OK, I will write code. I played with Ceph before, but never tried to actually write code. Uh, I picked a contribution that uh, was trivial. And so I saw that there were not many tests, unit tests, in, in Ceph. And I know that a contribution that is a unit test is more likely to be accepted because it does not change the behavior of the software in any way. So even if there is a mistake in the unit test, uh, then it won't break anything. So it's a good area to, to start with. With projects where there are a lot of unit tests, uh, then you, uh, it's fairly difficult. It may not be the easiest pick. Uh, but in the case of Ceph, it was kind of obvious that I could make a difference and be accepted uh, more easily. So that's what I did. I chose this path because it was the easiest one. Whatever path you choose, if you have a long-term goal, such as you, you want to contribute to Rados Gateway to uh, have uh, geo-replication work better, whatever uh, easy path you choose, you will learn a lot of things in the process. You will learn the code base, you will learn the people, you will learn how the quality insurance works, you will learn how to handle the bugs, how to diagnose them, how to debug things, etc., etc. So even the easiest contribution 
tells you a lot about the, about the project. If you don't get to have uh, something like the, uh, the unit test I mentioned for SAF, you get to take a look at the list of bugs that exist and uh, try to choose a low-hanging fruit. <clears throat> Where the project has that. I don't think Seth has a list of low hanging fruit. So let's say you don't have that. Uh, what you can do is you go, and I actually I did that yesterday uh, for uh, various reasons. Uh, I was, I had to get my mind off what I was doing uh, onto something else. So I decided, okay, let's say I'm a new contributor and I will pick a bug. I went to the bug tracker and I listed the bugs in order of the most recent first. And I went through all of them. I read it. I, if I didn't understand it, then I skip. If I understand it half, then I tried to dig, figure out if I was able to fix it within the day. And if I, it felt that I had to learn more, then I, I went away. So when you're a new contributor, it's typically what you do. Okay, oh, this one I can't. Oh, this one maybe. Okay, let's dig further. Oh, that looks complicated. Okay, oh, I skip it. And I try another. I evaluated maybe 40 or 50 of such bugs before I could find a bug that said, oh, that's an easy one. I can, I, I can do that. And I, so I did. I sent the, the patch that was merged uh, tonight because it was uh, a trivial one. That's typically what you want to do when you first contribute. So for you, uh, the, the goal of this training would be that uh, you submit uh, one patch every day. That's right. That's a very ambitious goal. But you already know the project, so we'll try to do that. Uh, when you have a big, big task, and it happens often when you, you run into a bug and you feel like you can fix it. It's described in a ticket, but it turns out to be more than one bug. So you have to slice it. Actually, splitting a bug is a contribution on its own. By contribution in the, in the context of upstream university, it needs to be something that someone accepts. So let me give you an example. If you have a wiki page and you fix typos in the wiki page and then you save, it's not a contribution in the context of upstream university because nobody had to give you uh, to accept your contribution. You just gave yourself the, uh, the permission to do that. So the, the contribution is when you split a task, uh, in the tracker, you can do it on your own, so it's not technically uh, a contribution. Yet, if you want to do it properly, usually you speak to the people who reported the bug, you speak to the people who owns the bug, maybe, to advocate that you have a better idea that it should be split in two, where they didn't see it. So that your contribution would be mm, much easier to split it in two. The upstream acceptance of your contribution could be that you get a positive feedback from both the person who submitted the bug and the person who is working on it. So most likely what happens there is that the person who works on the bug will keep working on half of the bug and you will take the other half, for instance. That's the case, the, the simple case of a bug that is uh, twofold. Uh, but in the case of erasure coding, for instance, uh, it's a very big task that needs to be sliced in many uh, simpler tasks. It can be tremendously difficult. And in the case of erasure encoding, it's actually the thing that causes me more trouble than anything else. Figuring out what tasks uh, can be set as a task 
as opposed to this big story that is erasure coding. I didn't, uh, I've been working on that for almost two months now, I don't know yet. In order to know that for a large contribution, you would have to know the project very well and have a vision, which Sam and Sage have, but as a contributor, I don't. I could ask them, uh, okay, I'm going to write the code, uh, but you have to design the plan. But that would be overlooking the fact that designing the plan uh, is fairly complex, even for them. So they will do it maybe in a few days, where it takes me weeks to figure out, but they don't have these few days. So as a contributor, I have to find a way to design this plan, slice in smaller tasks, and use the time of the upstream so that it does not exceed the time they would spend doing this plan themselves. So if I, uh, let's say, retro-coding the plan would take five days from Sam. My time slot, acceptable time slot for a contributor, I suppose, it's complete, it's wide guess, because we don't get to measure things this way. But I suppose that it would be, uh, I would be a good contributor, I would be considered having a good impact if I use, uh, let's say, one day of Sam's time to slice these big tasks into smaller tasks. If I end up nagging Sam so often and for so long that he ends up spending five days uh, explaining me where to go, then he would uh, say, okay, I should have done that myself. That would have been easier and faster. He lost his time, I lost my time. So that's a very difficult path to, uh, to, uh, to walk. And also there is a time frame. When you do that for a very large contribution, if you don't do it fast enough, then it becomes obsolete, it becomes that someone else can do it, so it has to be done fast, and that, yeah, it's really complicated. Once you've found, found a bug or a contribution that is small enough uh, or has been split, uh, you have to own it. Uh, it's kind of obvious, but when you have a very small contribution, uh, it's not. Because someone else can, within the hour, come, take the bug, fix it, submit it, and while you are working on it, let's say it takes you two hours. So you have to try to own it. Um, as opposed to, oh, let's say I will um, work on that bug, and if I'm sure I can fix it, then I will say I, uh, I, I do that. For a simple, uh, simple bug, you must own it at the risk of uh, being mistaken and being in the and after that saying, okay, I thought I could do that, but uh, it turns out uh, it's too big for me, so I give up. So you take this risk, but uh, you want to avoid parallel development. So in the, in the goal of having one bug submitted every day, you have to make that bet. And so you run the bug and uh, you do it quick. What happens sometimes also is that there are duplicates of bugs. That happens uh, quite often, actually. And when you're a contributor and you have a list of low hanging fruits, which is not the case in Ceph, I think, but in the case of OpenStack, for instance, you have this list. So new contributors come to the list and quickly fix the easy bugs. But if you have a duplicate, then chances are very high that your bug will be fixed by another bug. And then you will have a conflict in, your, in the marriage. Once you've done that, uh, that is assigning to yourself the bug, so in, in the case of Ceph, you go to uh, the tracker, tracker.ceph.com, and you assign it to yourself so people know you're working on it. You make it, you, you click it, and you say, okay, it's in progress. Then you can also go to uh, IRC and ask a question about the bug. Choosing the question is fairly easy. 
uh, you first think about how you will go, uh, go about fixing the bug. And when you fix the bug, unless it's completely trivial, chances are you will make a decision. You will make the decision to do it this way rather than this way. And whenever you make uh, a choice, it's a good opportunity to ask the question about, I did this choice, what do you think about it? You don't actually expect an answer because the question will be fairly trivial. Uh, but if you get an answer, that's a good thing. Maybe people will say, oh, no, 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 don't do that. We don't usually do that. We, we do it the other way, which you may not know because you've not seen that many uh, code or patches so far. Then you post that, and uh, you're done uh, with the contribution process, mostly. So we, we came to, to the end of the technical contribution process. When you interact, either by asking questions on the mailing list on our RRC, when you submit your patch and you review about it, you ask questions, technical questions, you negotiate all that, you behave in the community. And some communities have a code of conduct, which is not the case for SAF, but it turns out that uh, the originators of the project have a very gentle and amicable mindset. So uh, people behave. And I, in the past year, I have not seen one framework. I have not seen people insult each other, no matter what disagreement they have. I have not seen that. Other projects are notorious about their uh, disputes, such as Debian, for instance which I am a Debian developer, I love Debian, but I must acknowledge that uh, it's a community where there are a lot of disputes and there is no code of conduct. Not having a code of conduct is no excuse for behaving badly, but uh, the good thing is, even if your project, the project you contribute to does not have a code of conduct, you can point to other projects you have. For instance, Ubuntu has, or GNOME has a code of conduct. And you can uh, point to the list of things that are expected when you behave in a community around code. Be considerate, be respectful, be collaborative, or kind of self-explanatory, I won't go over that. Something that we don't often do is when we disagree, we consult others. Uh, as a contributor, my opinion is that you don't get to disagree at all. You don't get a say. You, you don't have an opinion. Thing is, unless the project just started, there is a lot of history. And disagreeing on something such as uh, the coding style, or the bug tracker, or even uh, the way a piece of code was written, requires that you know why it happened this way. And what the history behind that. And you don't know enough. So my policy when I come to uh, a new project is for at least a year of involvement, uh, I'm in a complete state of not disagreeing with anyone because I don't know enough to disagree with anyone. And that's relieves the we consult all the part of the code of conduct. When you see that someone maybe goes sideways, uh, it may help to suggest to him that he consult with others. Or you could be, as a contributor, you could deflect by uh, talking to the guy, because uh, then he will, he will maybe lash at you, he will be angry at you, uh, but you can do that on purpose, so that he is not angry, uh, it diffuse the thing. But I, I tend to just stay out of this. When you have a doubt, you ask for help. Uh, this is kind of obvious, but we, we tend to be proud uh, as developers. I know it took me uh, more than 10 years uh, to accept the fact that I will not be able to solve every problem all the time. 
And even after that, it took me a long time to actually behave as if I will not have a um, solution to all the problems, including cabling or even going to the grocery or finding the least price, etc. We, because we do, uh, we do software, we, we tend to solve problems. And when we have a problem in front of us, we tend to try to solve it all by ourselves. Where there are people outside who are there to help us. Or we, we could just ask if we are in a difficult spot, not if we are just blocked, but if we feel that we uh, slow down. So in the case of Seth, we are very lucky because we have two community managers, Patrick and um, Ross. So they, they are people who are uh, supportive of the community and as contributors, we are part of the community. The last step is very, very important when we are a contributor. We, uh, it is uh, say probably mostly in the context where you are the upstream and you give up your project and how do you step down? So you make sure that another lead comes in so the project keeps going on. But as a contributor, you also have this responsibility. If, if you've done, let's say, something very simple. Uh, you come to a project, you make a patch, and it's accepted. Stepping down in this context seems completely meaningless, but it's not. Because you've done this contribution, three months after that, someone will look at your patch, and depending on the comment you made, will it will make it easy for him to understand what you did, or it will make it completely cryptic. And it's fairly easy to write a comment on a commit patch that is self-explanatory at day one when you submit it. But if you think, oh, what will happen if I read it in three months from now, from the perspective of someone trying to understand how that happened, and not, is it good to fix the problem from the bug, blah, blah. Will it make sense? So if you try to think not only about the time you live in, but also what will happen when someone comes back in time, then you step down considerately because you give the keys to your future uh, self or someone else to come back to your contribution. And when you do something that is much uh, larger, such as uh, erasure coding, for instance, uh, I must do it in a way that allows me to disappear without erasure coding becoming a burden for the project because it was ill-conceived or relied too much on things that only me know. Uh, the way I went about that, for instance, there are many strategies to, when you do a large contribution, you have to do many things in order for that to happen. Uh, one of the things I did is I did not prepare the code in secret in order to then give it to Seth. I did uh, choose to discuss about the making of this erasure coding code from day one even before figuring out uh, how it should be implemented. Actually, I don't yet fully understand how it should be implemented. And by doing that, it slowly, the knowledge about erasure coding slowly spreads to all the community. And people get to have their, uh, get a say about, oh, you should do that this way, which happened uh, last week. There was a very interesting discussion on the mailing list, and many people uh, actually not many, but two or three people say, oh, maybe you, you should do it this way. And these people will remember, maybe later on they will code, maybe they will uh, be able to help someone who comes to fix the bugs, etc. So that's my plan for stepping down considerately in the future. The contribution is not finished yet, but the context that allows me to disappear uh, is already set. So as I say, and this is redundant to what I said uh, uh, before, uh, I, I advise you to never disagree with anything. Uh, 
And that's where the friends uh, come, come in handy, because when you actually disagree, you say, oh, this coding standard is shit. Then you can say it to uh, your friends, and, but as a contributor, you say, okay, I accept that. That's the way it is. And I, I'm not interested in contributing a new coding style. I'm interested in contributing a new feature or a new bug. That makes you out of the, all the flamewares and you will not, never have enemies and the world would be a better place. Understanding the conventions is very important when we come to a project uh, because <clears throat> the, there are conventions to be respected. You, you can read the policy, and there is one for Ceph, for instance. Uh, and you have to abide to obey these conventions more than the project uh, coders who are already contributing. So I, it's, it's a good thing to be very worried about the convention of the project when you start the project, start contributing to the project. You can go over the, this, um, these conventions, how they are written. You can ask questions about them. And people will not resent you for that. You, uh, for instance, in Ceph, you have this uh, space after an if, or uh, the star, uh, of, of a pointer is to the left of the variable name as opposed to the right of the type name, which is for me, it's not a reflex. So it was not written, but it was used uh, all over the code. And then I discovered that uh, it was not always the case. Sometimes uh, it was the other way around. And then when I saw that, I discovered that most of the time it's this way, but sometimes it's not. I did not disagree with this. I did not even dispute that. I did not even say, oh, sometimes it's not correct, it should be fixed, etc. I just do it the way it's done uh, most of the time. When I first contributed uh, the larger patch I did, Sam told me that there was this rule uh, of no, no more than 80 characters per line. That uh, I tend to do very long lines. I didn't think about that. So I uh, use a tool. Uh, there is a tool in Emacs actually to do that, to figure out which line are over uh, 80 characters and uh, split them. Then I run into a difficulty because it's not always the case. Some lines are more than 80 characters uh, in the existing code, but they are not massively long lines. So I, I went over the files that I modified and uh, obeyed this, uh, this rule to the best of my ability, even changing a few lines that were not mine to, to be spliced. So I was very diligent in applying them, and I will keep doing that uh, because it's a matter of being polite toward the people in the project. And I remember that when I was the upstream of a project, some contributors just didn't care about the policy. But they were good coders. And as an upstream, uh, I was happy to have their contribution. But I was also somewhat irritated by their uh, disrespect of the coding style. Not to the point where I went to them and say, okay, well, you, you should do that because it was kind of nitpicking from me. So it's a, it's a way to behave politely and it's almost never a uh, dispute, but it's always appreciated. So. And another way to uh, to be polite and to link to stepping down considerately and also to speed up the review process is to explain what you're doing uh, very clearly. So it's quite difficult for us because we're uh, native French speakers and explaining things very, uh, very clearly in English is difficult, it takes more from us than the other contributors. 
a few guys 